I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're speaking with Alan Scher. We're happy to welcome him back to our show. He is a Renaissance man with a rich life experience, ranging from being a barrister to working for the Liberal Party. And he shares a unique blend of professional and personal stories. With deep family roots in Sunderland, his memories weave together lessons learned from his mother, Esther Scher, the challenges of managing a business, and a passion for civic matters. Alan's journey has led to insights into management, education, politics, and social issues, all of which are captured in his stories, highlighting his commitment to excellence, learning, and personal growth. Among his notable literary works is Management Letters in Serious Pursuit of Excellence. We are delighted to have Alan join us here today on Spotlight once again. We thank the team at Prime 7 Media for helping us put him in the spotlight. We ask viewers like you to support creators like him by subscribing to our channel. Alan, so good to see you here today on Spotlight. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be with you again and meet up with you. So uh, let's get cracking into this little story of mine, which I think, uh, I hope people find very interesting, uh, as well as explaining how on earth it was that I came to write management letters when the last thing I thought I would ever do when I was at school was write anything and certainly not write about management. So as I say, it's, it's a, it was a surprise to me as to you maybe when you hear the story. Absolutely. Now, this is a new edition that's coming out of Management Letters and Serious Pursuit of Excellence, and it's updated with lots of more stories, lots of great information. So let's give the folks an overview of what the book is about. Can I begin by explaining to people where I actually am, uh, because uh, it's relevant. Um, and this, I've just got a map of it. Uh, if you can read it, mm -hmm. it's uh, the uh, northeast of England. It's called the Land of Three Rivers. The three rivers being the Tyne, the Weir and the Tees. I'm currently in Newcastle on the Tyne. The story is told on the Weir uh, and the, 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 the Sunderland is on the Weir. And, uh, um, as it, and, the, and, the, and the pride and joy of the area is this photograph here, uh, which is Durham. And mm. if, if you chance to get to Durham, do it as a most magnificent city. It, you can see here a castle and a cathedral. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. They reckon it's one of the finest views in the country, looking over the river to the castle and cathedral. And it's actually the home of Durham University. So I'll, I'll give that a plug here, if I may. <laughs> absolutely. But, well, this is where I was, and this is where I am. And when I was young, I wanted to get as far away from it as possible. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm delighted that I failed because I live here in the Northeast very happily at the moment. Um, anyway, just let me explain one thing to you. Um, this is the book, which is, you know, Management Letters. Mm -hmm. and this is the front cover of it. Mm -hmm. You can see there uh, that there are not three characters, but four characters. The four characters are uh, my mother, uh, me, my manager, Mike Brown, and the building itself. Yes. And the building itself is part of, very important part of the story. So let's begin there and go on from there. Um, can I just show you this picture? Mm -hmm. This is the picture of the building. Uh, sorry, and it's got it's the same picture, of course. Now, that was the basis for the cover of the book. Yes. And first, I had experience working for the Liberal Party with graphic design. I was able to have some input into the way that showed itself on the cover of the book, which uh, is uh, interesting, but uh, uh, interesting especially in this context that I now compare with that this photograph. Now this photograph, you can see, this is how I remember it when I was a boy. Um, and you will see the, the name A. Share and Sons Limited above the door. Uh, a. Share there was my grandfather. Um, mm. And you can see that that building doesn't look very attractive. My, uh, my father actually ran the show and uh, 
He used to play patients waiting for customers. And I thought the last thing I want to do with my life is to do that. Yeah. I never want to be a barrister. I want to be in court arguing cases. And so that was where uh, I was headed in my young days. Well, again, it shows how you can't anticipate the future when you're young. You can't definitely get it right for yourself when you're young. Because I can now tell you this, and this is really the, the, the basis for what I'm talking about today. That was when I was young. Today, that same company, and I've not been a part of it for 30 years, boasts this. Mm. Wow. Now, that means that same company today has a hundred branches and boasts excellence from 348,938 wow. reviews. Right. That, that is really quite remarkable. I don't claim the credit for all of that because I retired some time ago and I haven't got a stake in it. But that is the remarkable thing. But and you built a brand and that brand it, lives on it, and thrives it, and is doing it, great. There are a lot of things to learn which I hope we can talk about in the in the, in the next uh, uh, few minutes because uh, it tells a story. Uh, but let's begin with the other three characters, including me, um, in that in this narrative. The first one is my mother. Now, um, can I put it this way? Um, people go on today about the equality of the sexes and so on, and worry about women and, and now I've got to tell you that with my mother there's no doubt uh, who's the superior sex it's the <laughs> women <laughs> exactly <laughs> I'm going to tell you that my marriage didn't didn't change that because uh, my my mother in fact illustrates a point uh, that it's amazing how far you can get in life um without a degree mm -hmm. and it's amazing how you can aspire to excellence without a degree and have a very full and satisfying life without one. And that's yeah. part of what I'm trying to say elsewhere. Uh, now, my wife, on the other hand, in fact, she actually got two degrees. Mm -hmm. And she's match for any man, in my yeah. view, um, because uh, she used her second degree to help her clients in the tribunal unit of the as a volunteer of the Citizens Advice Bureau in Sunderland. So uh, I've got a lot of time for women. and, and in my other books and writings, I do tell you a little about who they are. But the first thing was I was very, very lucky with my mother. Uh, she was actually trained um, by her father in office work. And uh, so she came to it quite naturally. And she, in fact, looked after the books throughout the whole of my working life in the company. And uh, um, I'll give you an illustration of how good she was. Um, nothing was paid without her signing it off. And mm. one summer's day, somebody came to her and said, will you pay the gas bill? And she looked at it and then she said, can I look at the bill last year? And she compared, why is the gas bill so much higher this summer than it was last, she said. Well, nobody thought to ask, had they? Well, the answer was no. there'd been a gas leak. And oh, the wow. gas, the, the actual, there was a gas heater uh, in, the sea, in the ceiling above the ceiling of one of our branches. If somebody had struck a match underneath it, it had gone up. Wow. <laughs> she spotted it. And people used to say, but she has the, 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 the chairman's finger. She was very good at her job, but she enjoyed it. Mm. Now, I retired at 60. She retired at 90. <laughs> and, and negotiated five-year contracts of service. She wanted to continue, and she could have continued, but right. for a little accident. So mm. she was... One heck of a remarkable lady. And uh, the other thing, her gift to me was to give me a love of family. Mm -hmm. And a love of family is very important in my life. Um, well, our firm, as you will see as we go on, was a yeah. family firm. And I got a lot of time for family firms. And you'll see how that works out. But that was the first character. The second character, well, you've already talked about me a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought I'd become a barrister. And so uh, I trained and went to the bar in Manchester. Well, it was very fine in one respect because I met some absolutely wonderful lawyers. Mm -hmm. One of the lawyers became Lord Justice Sir Ian Glidewell. So he was no slouch. His father 
was my pupil master. So I, you know, I had a great time going around with him because the tradition in the furniture in the in the uh, the profession is for the senior members to teach the younger members what goes on. So his father took me around in his Bristol car and mm. I watched him cross-examine planners. Well, once you see that, once he never forgotten. So I had a great experience there, but I wasn't cut out to be a lawyer and I could mm. see that. I was a bit young anyway. And I was then in tempted by my interest in the Liberal Party to accept a job as the right-hand man of the secretary of the Liberal Party organization in London. And that, again, was a learning experience for me. Um, I learned a bit about the Liberals, um, and I also learned about graphic design because a man called Bartley Powell was bringing the Liberal Party into the 20th century halfway through it. And that learning experience of graphic design, again, has stood me in good stead. Hmm. But what happened was that I, um, that what happened was that my father was ill with cancer and my mother was keeping the show on the road. And I decided that I'd better go back north and for better or worse, manage the business. And that's when I made my third <laughs> mistake, if you wanted to call it a mistake, when I got back to the northeast, because I felt well, the, 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 the shop was in the wrong place. So I opened up a, a brand new shop in the center of Sunderland. And this had on the first floor uh, a display bungalow uh, and a kiddies play area. Uh, and it had a coffee lounge the, the, oh. and a maze. Um, and in the bungalow, I put a stained and stone fireplace. It was magnificent. Anyway, before it even opened, the building inspector came round and said, have you calculated the whether the building will support the fireplace? because it was stone, and my designer hadn't. And so we had to take part of it away, subject of wood. No sooner had he gone, than the fire inspector came along. And he said to me, he said, uh, you know, this bungalow, it's dangerous. I said, why is it dangerous? There's no fire escape. <laughs> so we had to put one in. And then he, then he looked at the plans. He said, maze? You can't have a maze. I said, wow. why can't we have a maze? He said, because if there's a fire, people get lost. So <laughs> that wasn't very good either. So anyway, we had to sort that. But the, the kiddies didn't use the play area. And the other trouble was that people didn't like awfully my choice of furniture. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'd been going to furniture exhibition at Earl's Court, choosing furniture I liked, and hoping that it, people would like it as well and buy it. Well, it, it, they, they bought more than they did in the other one, but mm -hmm. not enough. So that, in a kind of a way, was my third mistake. Um, and this is when I began to learn the real world, you see. Yeah. And it was sheer luck, because two guys come to me, and they're manufacturers, and they say, you've got it all wrong. And I said, why have I got it all wrong? He said, well, you need a manager. I said, I'm the manager. He said, no, you're not. You're the owner. And they helped me to headhunt a manager. Mike Brown. Mm. Now, that's when I began to see what life was all about. My eyes were open from that moment onwards at the age of 40. And that was all the difference in the world. And the mm. other thing they said to me was that, that people don't want your choice. They want a choice. And that was also significant. And they weren't all that interested in display. They just wanted as big a choice as possible. And they also wanted a good value, you see, and not just whatever happened to be going as the price of the time. Yeah. Well, now, come in Mike Brown, you see, and he, in fact, was a professional manager. He had been one. And this, again, is relevant because he knew what professional management was all about. He would go to Earl's Court at Furniture Exhibition, not in order to choose furniture he liked, but furniture he thought his customers would like. And mm. when he saw it, he would then start to bargain the price and say, suppose I sell 25 or 50 or 100, will you give me a better price? And if you get a better price, you can sell at a better price. And then he says to me, he said, I've got a good salesman. And he introduced me to a man called Joe Carty. I've never forgotten because I'd never employed Joe Carty. He really was a rough diamond. 
but by golly, could he, could he sell? And mm. so that's when I also learned about selling. So that really was really my starting point uh, for this book, because that's when I really began to learn for the very first time what management was all about. And uh, it explains why I could, 20 years later, I was able to 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 write this book. Because um, 20 years later, the company had grown in the northeast of England, and, and it was grown sufficiently for me to say, I've really had enough entrepreneuring. Um, I think the time is for me to retire. So mm -hmm. in 1993, um, I decided to stop being a retailer altogether and and retire. Um, and as I said, um, uh, there's another life to follow. I give yeah. myself a pause for breath here, if I may. Um, <laughs> does that tempt any questions to you? Uh, absolutely. I think your lesson there was there's a big difference between owning something and managing something. And as an owner, your role is to hire the best and find the people who will have the answers and pursue excellence. I think that's when your, your um, ideas of pursuing excellence were fully fomented, uh, don't you think? Fomented. Yeah, I, I, as I say, that certainly one of the things I realized was that I couldn't do this thing on my own anyway, that it's a team job and you need good people in the team to do the job. Um, can I say that now I just draw a few lessons myself from what I've just said to you. Uh, the first thing, I can't get away from my political being here. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the, the fact is that people um, question the word profit um, in life. You know, they, they, they don't, don't like the idea of companies making a profit. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I've got to say that if you look at the, the growth of the company, um, it, it couldn't have done that without profit. Right. Because every time you opened a new branch, you had to, 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 to adapt it, you had to stock it, you need, and you had to get people to invest in it, to put money into it. So profit was absolutely the essence uh, yeah. of the whole thing. So it's a, it's a very important... Like this situation, if you really think about it, is, is the, the explanation of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Because this is capitalism as it is best. It was a win-win-win situation for absolutely everybody, for yeah. the manufacturers, for those who were in re involved in retailing, for our customers, uh, for investors, uh, and also for the taxman. So the, the trouble with profit is only if it's, if it's uh, abused and exploited. Right. By a monopoly, but there's nothing wrong with profit. In fact, if profit makes the world go around. Without profit, exactly. there would have been nothing there. And the real moral of the story, that the real thing to worry about, is not profit, but power and the abuse of power. That's exactly. much more dangerous than anything else. And that was one of the important lessons that I picked up out of yeah. this. And the other thing is this: that I don't think people realize why those who invest in businesses um, deserve to be rewarded for it. Yeah. The answer is they take a risk. Yeah. Um, you see, if I open a new branch, I'm committing myself to back up a lease, for example, never mind the contents of it, mm -hmm. and sign up for high rent for 25 years. Yeah. Well, well, one reason I retired is I didn't want any more of that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's dangerous. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, the fact is why people want a reward for risk is because there is real risk there. Mm -hmm. And if now there are some people who are what are called risk averse and right. what they go and do is they join the civil service. which yeah. is, And there was an article in The Times just this week saying that this is part of the problem of the civil service. That it, it's in this country anyway, that yeah. it is risk averse. And so do take account of the fact that People in who are entrepreneurs, the one thing they've got to be is risk favor. You know, you've got to favor risk. There's no, exactly. other, no other. You've got to enjoy the. You've got to enjoy it and actually like it. And I think rather like Mike Brown, you see, uh, he really loved taking the risk and being an entrepreneur. And he 
stayed the journey much longer than I did. Yeah. Uh, that I hope it, it was something else that I picked up from it. The other thing that I really just now picked up from is the value of people. Mm. Now, I think this again is underestimated. I've got a lovely story to tell you here. Mm -hmm. The story is of Leslie Sheraton. Hang on, I'll just get my picture of Leslie Sheraton. Okay. This is my picture of Leslie Sheraton. God, that's a great picture. Right now, yeah. let me explain this picture. Leslie Sheraton was trained by my mother as a mm. clerk. She became my secretary. She mm. became secretary to my successor. She became secretary to his successor. Mm. And I was present when she retired as the assistant company secretary of a PLC, which is one heck of a career for a girl. Yeah. Don't think she went to university, not for any length of time anyway. Yeah. And... Uh, She's now come back to me as my secretary. Wonderful. Because she oh, thinks it's come full circle. It's come full circle. Now I find this, and this is a picture. This is the picture that was taken when she retired. Right. So we were both rather joyful, and yeah. you know, still joyful. Uh, and it's a piece of good fortune that she is still there to this day. But That's great. as I say, people in my life were extraordinarily important and not just important they were more than that yeah. i'll show you another picture now this picture is a man called john holland and mm -hmm. his wife jean now sadly they're both of them no longer alive mm -hmm. john was our company accountant now he was a fine man and did great service for the company but we both retired and we've enjoyed enormously playing bridge and golf together and some lovely meals together. And so friendship was very, very important. Exactly. Um, and, and you treasure these things. And it's part of the, the thing that I try to say to people. These things are more valuable than money, you know, really, when it, when, when it come, all comes to all. Friendship. But now I'm going to show you a picture which I treasure. I really do treasure this picture. Now, this is an old picture. Mm -hmm. and you can see in this picture on the extreme, this one here, that's yep. Mike. Yep, Mike Brown. My, is in the mid My mother is in the middle. Yep, I see her. And the guy holding the baby is a guy called Bill Field, who was okay. my van driver. Okay. Now, now, Bill Field, in fact, was at Dunkirk. Wow. And, and got away from Dunkirk. Amazing. But that's not the point about him. His mother, no, as well, his wife came with him to be interviewed for the job. Wow. And when he was offered some money, his his wife said it's not enough. <laughs> and my father paid him a bit more. But even he's not the person I want to talk about. Okay. The person I want to talk about is this young lad here, Steve Ditch. Okay. Now Steve Ditch worked in the warehouse. Um, and under Bill Hardy, the warehouse manager. And one, now Steve Ditch, I must tell you, at that time in his life, you know, we played football very keenly in the northeast of England, and there are derby matches between Sunderland and Newcastle. Well, if there'd been a derby match, he'd have loved a fight. He was that sort of lad, if you like. Most of them were. Anyway, one day he arrives at work as a skinhead because he has shaved all his hair off. <laughs> um, well, now, Bill Hardy says, look, you wear a cap until your hair grows. And so he, obviously, to keep the job, he did. But now the point of my story. There came a time, sometime after that, when Bill Hardy died. Hmm. And then after that, I meet up with Steve, and Steve tells me that he had visited, visited his widow. Hmm. Now, I'd never... To be honest with you, I'd never thought of doing that. Right. And uh, that says something about him, and it says something about Bill. And it says something about life, and it says something about people. Yeah. You see? And um, Steve Ditch stayed on in the company to be a van driver. I think he may even be one today. Mm. Um, now, I'll tell you one other thing, which I've learned, 
if you like. When I talked about those trust pilot recommendations, over 300,000 of them, how does a company get 300,000 trust house pilot recommendations? The answer is because of the van driver. Mm. Because the van driver is the last port of call. So it's people like Bill Hardy and Steve Ditch of this world. Those are the people who can achieve excellence in their own way. I think it was Yevchuchenko who said, let every man be great, including the man who makes my galoshes. Exactly. And, and, yeah. and that is a point which I do try to make in other things. It's not a question of getting university or failing in life. That's not it. That's not it at all. And uh, that's relevant to the other things I write about in Death of a Nightingale. Uh, and that is that it's not just the kids who are in special needs school who need to have a curriculum suitable for them not to get into university, but just suitable for them. It's all the kids who don't go to university, yeah. who don't want to go or can't go, who need a different route because one size does not fit all. And that's the other thing I tried to talk about today. But that is, uh, that's a separate issue. I don't want to talk about that now. I just want to carry on here with this uh, narrative here. Let me just, uh, I've got, I don't know, let me pause to give you any other thoughts or questions arising out of all of well, that. Well, I, I think you make a great point that uh, it doesn't matter your educational background. What matters is, is your diligence and commitment and your hard work. Uh, and that can make a difference in the company. Uh, you can have a great CEO, but if the guy driving the van isn't strong, you got a problem with your company. Um, so that's great that you value every member of your uh, company so strongly and remember them so fondly. And the fact that we work in our jobs, the relationships that we make are our lives. We spend more time at work often than in our homes. Right. So it's That's a great, great story you tell. Ashley Watts is another person you write about. Do you want to share with us the story? I'd love to huh? share about that because it rounds it all off in a kind of a way. Um, let me tell you about Ashley. Um, I belong, I still belong to the Rotary Club of Sunderland. Mm -hmm. and the Rotary is got a motto which is service before self and uh, I met there a man called Fredwin Haynes who was the the head teacher he was a very charismatic head teacher of a special school uh, for kids with a physical disability and a learning difficulty now um, I had had no experience at all of, of disability or special needs or anything but I was very happy to go along as a governor. Then I became chairman of governors of this school. And that's where I met Ashley. Ashley was a young girl in a wheelchair. Uh, Ros, my wife, also used to pop into the school to help her with her reading. Now, Ashley was a very feisty girl, even then. Uh, the, there were presentation evenings where everybody seemed to be winning something. And I remember one of these, even there was a little cameo setting where she hit the head teacher over the head with a rolled up newspaper. So, <laughs> you know, she's that sort of girl. Spicy. She also appeared in the local amateur dramatics. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, the school, although it was a great school, was under threat because the flavor of the times was to close schools like that and put them uh, and, and put the kids into mainstream schools um, to avoid them being segregated, as they said. Well, the director of education came uh, to the school and said, this is what's going to happen here. And, and the parent governor said, can there be a vote? Not one hand went up in favour of the close of the school. But it didn't stop the, the local authority trying to close it. Hmm. And so the parents had a campaign and they raised, with the aid of the local newspaper, over... 14,000 reasoned objections to closure, not just a petition, but 14,000 yeah. reasoned objections to closure, and they lobbied for it. And I've got a picture here. Now, this is a picture I really shouldn't show you because it's taken from the Sunderland Echo at the time. Uh -huh. And I've not been, permission, not been given permission by the editor of the Sunderland Echo to show these photographs, but I'm taking a risk. <laughs> You here because great risk is, is great reward because, because i risk it there's yeah. a picture at the bottom is 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 ashley beautiful right? young lady a lovely young lady that they're, they're the parents lobbying david blunkett who was a labor minister at the time with these um uh, with the, the 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 all all the objections amazing 
amazing. Anyway, um, the fact is that the parent, the, the 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 parents won the campaign uh, at the time. Mm. Um, in fact, the school, uh, the never mind what happened afterwards. But uh, the the parents, the the the, the government rejected the plans to close the school, just put it like mm. that at this stage. Um, but my friendship with Ashley continued. I made her the hero, heroine, in my book, uh, Death of a Nightingale, which I staged on the play. On the, on, um, and uh, anyway, we'll come to that in a minute. But this is a photograph of Ashley at her wedding. Wow. That's a lot of life, a lot of gusto. She's she having a lot of fun. She's got a lovely husband she's got a beautiful husband now nice. and uh, she in fact took her husband to be to dance city to learn how to dance at her wedding wow and i believe she's still dancing Amazing. now the long story about ashley is even just this last two or three weeks where she's made the national newspapers mm. she's had a feature in hello magazine and she was on breakfast television why because even though she's in a wheelchair, she's just adopted a little boy. Wonderful. Called... And that is, in my view, absolutely beautiful story. That and is a beautiful story. And it shows story. you the triumph of the human spirit. And that, you know, today we need stories like this. Yes. We really badly do. I went to see the, the film Oppenheimer the other night, and mm -hmm. I shed a, a tear, literally, for humanity when mm. I watch that film i really felt myself a tear coming in my ear when i see what man is doing to itself and yeah. it really 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 got to, to look out and, and 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 then i think of kids like ashley becoming the sort of women that they are and i think my goodness me we really better start behaving ourselves as human beings and not fighting unnecessary wars or anything like that and just save the planet and that's really where i come from absolutely and, uh, the, so this is the picture. This is the picture of Tracy, okay. in, who was in my play. Right now, Tracy was the actress. Was the was a character built really around uh, around Ashley. Ashley. Yeah, and Absolutely. I gave her these words. I read them out. Sure. I tell you something. Lawyers and politicians just love to give us our rights. Rights, I call them. Buttercups and daisies. And we are those little white dandelion heads. You know, they blow away in the wind. Beautiful. And I sadly see rights today sometimes blowing in the wind. Mm. That school, although the parents keep, fought to keep it alive, is still there. But it is now a different school altogether. Right. And I'm afraid their rights have not been respected. So I the things that I do now are not for myself at the age at which I am, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to just mm -hmm. tell younger people, don't think you know it all when you're young. Don't assume that what's right for you is right for everyone, because it isn't. Don't think you can build the future on a word, a sound bite, because the world is far more complicated than that. The word like equality, we're all equal sometimes. This is what I keep saying. We're equal sometimes, not equal always. We're different always. Mm -hmm. These are the things I try to say. But anyway, I don't, this ranting is, is well, one You've of done a wonderful job of telling them. I should do it, uh, because this is what I now feel. Uh, I've got this saying, you know, that... You reach the end of your life and you, this is T.S. Eliot, you reach the end of your journey and see it for the first time. Yeah. Well, that's really what I'm sharing. And really, I'm just thinking today, when I was thinking back to the story that we've been talking about today, there's one person I think who would be a bit surprised. Who's more that? than surprised. Um, and if he were alive. And that is this man. And that's my grandfather. Who started A. Sharon Sons. <laughs> Who started A. Sharon Sons. Wonderful. Yeah. And he came, he was welcomed. Let's be quite clear about this. He was welcomed to England mm. in the, the back end of the, 20, the 19th century to escape the pogroms in Eastern Europe. 
Amen. And uh, he'd actually died before I was born. He died in mm. 1927. But his name is still on the on the, the name of the company that has got all these the, 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 these uh, tributes and recognitions yeah. and so on. And I find that startling and a story well worth telling. And I hope you've enjoyed listening to it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The name of the book is Management Letters in Serious Pursuit of Excellence. You'll learn about business. You'll learn about management. But more importantly, you'll learn about life. This is a wonderful book that serves as a memoir as well that Alan Sher has written based on a number of letters that he wrote over the course of his years as the owner of A. Sher and Sons. And he has done a wonderful job in compiling them and giving you a whole lot more information. Alan, thank you so much. Before we leave today, anything you'd like the folks at home to know? No, I just wanted you to, to understand that this book was, I never thought when I wrote the letters that it, they would ever end up this way. They yeah. were letters, they were my gift to my company just before I retired. And yeah. they have, you only got to look down the contents page and see the, I don't know whether you can see this. Oh, sure, it's, absolutely. His communication, training, Murphy, Pace, we can see it all. Put it in writing, design, motivation, decision-taking, filing, needs and wants, meeting, service. Yep, you cover it all. And uh, so anybody who thinks that, that it does have this cautionary word. Anybody who thinks that going on strike does your firm any favors at all no. and you any favors at all, just realize that people are trying to manage the place and it doesn't lay, make life easier for the people who are trying to manage it. So you're not doing yourselves any favors if you go on strike because you're really damaging your own company when you do and you're damaging your own prospects when you do so think twice exactly before it you is, on strike. it's where your bread is buttered you don't want anything to happen to that bread well it's you know people to, people i think get really enthusiastic about standing up for uh, you know trying to get a bit of extra pay or whatever it is but just be careful when you go on strike because yeah. think of the other people who may suffer as well Absolutely. when you go on strike it's not it's not a simple matter just taking Certainly not in health, that's for sure. So Absolutely. that's my point. Absolutely. Anyway, it's really good to be with you. And I, I, I drink water. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, okay. Well, you know, the water looks good. I've got my tea here. I will toast <laughs> to you. Uh, cheers. You know, a well-led life yeah, that is still being lived come, with a lot of if energy. If you can extend your journey to... to uh, England. Newcastle, absolutely. Well, if it's not this year, I'll be going up to Northern Europe the following year. So I absolutely yeah. will have to check out Durham at your recommendation absolutely and Newcastle done. for sure. And we'll raise a pint there. That sounds great. Thanks yeah. so much for joining us here today on Spotlight, Alan. Great to be with you. Great. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.